Welcome to the first episode of a brand new season of Demol Belgi Grease recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstrong, and joining me as always is a Canadian who lies awake at night regretting the consequences of any bets he makes, Logan Saunders. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Saunders. We are back and incredibly late. Yay! <laughs> this is the most last minute recording I think we've probably ever done in six and a half years. So, go us! I let the timer run up. The, I, hear, I hear that the longer that we waited to record, that the higher the chances we would be getting an exemption. Well, given the incredible spread of coronavirus at the moment, we could be getting an exemption from the finale yet. <laughs> oh, it is rampant. 200 cases in Belgium alone. So we might not be seeing... Papa Bear, Jill DeCoster, uh, this year. I still have to hold out hope that we will be seeing uh, seeing best friend of the podcast, Jill, in, at the finale. Anything else, we just kind of have to work around, but we might be, just be getting an Antwerp trip between us yet. Yeah, well, the empty streets of Antwerp, if it's not locked down. It'll be the biggest mole sabotage ever, preventing the biggest annual celebration of the mole ever. It'll basically top any of Sinan sabotages or Sue's big move or anything like that. Yeah, and and, and Bart thought he did a great job of, of taking out 10,000 euros from the pot. Can we just say, I know I love to describe the start of Belgium Mole as basically Mole Christmas every year, but I was sat in, um, in Houston Airport on Tuesday evening beginning to watch this episode, and I got goosebumps again. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And this is not empty words. I love this show so much, and this premiere really reminded me why. They got so far into the negatives that people are trying to avoid winning, because what happens if you win at the end and the pot's at negative 2,000 euros? Like, do you have to pay Jills on the spot right then? And now everyone's just going to try and get executed earlier on so they avoid having to pay the bill? While I would love it if that happened, all that needs to happen, because obviously he has no concept of money, is Bart just needs to hand over €2,000 in cash to Jill at the time. Yeah. He can just step in and um, and give the, the winner a hand with the money. Yeah, and then Jill's going to be like, well, this pays for... My the cabana I'll be getting in Santorini for the next three weeks. <laughs> is there an open bar? There is always an open bar for Gilles de Costa. <laughs> All he needs is an open bar and an empty museum. Yeah. <laughs> Which are two things you can actually find quite easily during coronavirus times. Yeah, I know we're working on the assumption that this is going to be the last Belgian mall season for a little while, but it's the perfect time to film another one. You've got no Belgian tourists anywhere trying to um, bust where the mole is. You've got all the empty museums and all the empty places. All the hotels will be really cheap. It's the perfect time to film another one. <laughs> they would save a huge amount on budget. I hear China is super cheap this time of year. Well, v Vidum beat a uh, Belgian mole to filming in China. Yeah, but also, imagine a Belgian China season. You think we've had fun with, uh, with Vidum in China? I can guarantee that it would be ten times more fun if you unleashed Gilles and his crew there. Yeah, and then it's just negative, it'll be just negative 10,000 yen to start out with, which is, I think, not worth as much as the as much as much the euro. So, a bit of housekeeping as always. Um, the cast this season is slightly younger than last year. It's uh, an average age of 34.6, and last year was 35.1. Mexico was 37.7, because Steve is so old. Yeah, Steve was fucking old. Yeah, and the fan favourite first suspicions list from the Vidim season this year is back. I will put the link in all the show notes and everything, and it will be open until episode two airs. All you got to do is rank your contestants from most moly to least moly, and we will see if um, if anyone gets it correct. And if our instinct on who the mole is is correct for um, for Vidim this year, which I will find out on Saturday at Bundle Park, um. Nobody picks Rob as number one. I will spoil that now. It will go to second places. Mm. Which is hilarious. There are only two people in the cast that nobody picked as their first suspect, and Rob was one of them. It was the hat. It was that. 
And also back from our Vidim season is our predictions pool. It's kind of back from Belgi from last year, but we're actually making it a bit more formal this year. Um, Logan and I have each drafted four people for our teams, and the rule is that whoever goes first next week, that person will then be replaced by our straggler, our last person. And I don't think I even need to spoil who the person neither of us picks is, because it's incredibly obvious after this week. <laughs> but we'll get there at the end of this podcast. And switches are also back from the Vidim pool this year, but only one can be used per week this time, in a plea from Michelle for a rule change that's now going to come into, into fruition in this season. Michelle's not taking part in the team for this season? No, Michelle couldn't get the uh, couldn't get the episode watched fast enough, so she said it could just be the two of us. Oh, I see. And something we learned from the Café de Mole last week where all the cast were released was that someone actually thought that Greece was the layover. Because it's so close to Belgium. Yeah, because it's so close. They actually thought that Greece was not going to be the final location. It was just a, a stop off somewhere. Actually, Greece was a layover for me on the way to the Belgium finale last year. Well, like I stopped for the three three days, but yeah, I actually stopped on the way there. So we begin the episode a month before departure in Vilvorde, where ten unknown Flemings must work together to earn money. But the most important challenge that they have, they must do alone. Unmask the saboteur amongst them. Unmask them all. And at this point, I'm sat in the departure lounge just going, oh my god, this season's already amazing, I want to just keep watching this season now. And they all find out from best friend of the podcast, Shilda Costa, that they're going, and that they're already in the presence of the mole. And the mole speaks to them from behind the pane of glass wearing a robe, and makes them an offer, as the titles begin. And for the first time in Belgian mole history, we actually get an episode title, which is Alpha slash The Beginning. Oh, they're really going all in with this Greek theme. They are. And the actual episode begins in the hills of Meteoro in Greece. All ten are stood on the hillsides, wearing blindfolds and the robes, tied like straight jackets, and chained to the hillside. And Gilles says that they're spread along an ancient monk path. The first challenge is really easy. All they've got to do is reach the camera on a self-timer at the end of the path. If everyone's in it after 90 minutes, they will earn 5,000 euros for the pot. And it should be extremely easy for one person, thanks to a deal that they made with the mole. And it's contestant Jill who has the loose knot and frees his team... Jolene, Alina, and Dorian quickly. And he's the only one not attached to a chain to the hillside. Why is that? Because he is actually honourable. And I'm going to kind of skip to the end of this episode because he's probably the most tragic figure we've seen on one episode of The Mole since Ruth, I would argue. Because he played completely for the team and gets screwed over round one. Oh, he is so screwed by this season. It's very fun. He was the biggest team player for the first challenge. You don't win unless he's loosening up your knots. And that's not a euphemism. And to free themselves, Alina, Dorian, and Jolene must solve a logic puzzle, which they express proficiency in during the application process. And it's basically a bell-themed tower of Hanoi where a small bell can't be placed on top of a larger bell. And if they solve it correctly, they will get the three numbers that will unlock. I hear when Alina figured out the bell puzzle... That it was very nice, great success solving the puzzle. I was wondering how long it would take in this episode before you start doing Borat impressions for Alina. <laughs> the thing is, you know, if you keep doing these, she's going to be in the final three and you're going to have to actually talk to her at the end of the season. My sister has a mole. Why do you sound like Daniel Craig from Knives Out? <laughs> there has been a murder. I suspect foul play. I do declare king of the castle, Uwawa Wiwa. But yeah, you know if you keep doing Borat impressions whenever we talk about Alina, she's going to be in the final three, you're going to actually have to talk to her, and you know full well that I am going to finally do the joke that I've always wanted to do in these interviews, which is, have you heard Logan does an impression of you? Logan, do your impression of him. (laughs) The thing is, she doesn't sound anything like anybody from Borat. No, but... The even better thing is, she's one of the, I'd say about two or three incredible casting decisions this season already. After one episode, this is an amazing cast. They cast somebody who was an illegal citizen for 20 years. They cast someone who has a hair-trigger temper, and it's delightful. Because she is responsible for the quote of the episode for me, which is just, Fucking Christian and Dorian! I'm going to kill you! (laughs) And contestant Jill also needs to help the other two groups, so he gets to run up and down the monk path helping people. And Bart says that he thinks Christine is tall. 
Christian replies that that will be funny when the blindfolds come off. Yeah, you sound tall, <laughs> and it's the shortest contestant they've ever that they've ever had on any season of the mole. Oh, you can't you can't write that stuff. And yet, it's still not the most offensive thing said about Christian this episode. What was the most offensive thing? There is a dwarf tossing joke later in the episode. Oh, you mean when they were trying to get ring the bell? Yeah. When Salim literally suggests tossing a dwarf. He's like, yeah, we'll just toss Christian up to the bell, and then we'll just hopefully we'll catch him. Worst thing, he just hits the ground and bounces off. Like, Salim, this is not a good look on TV for you, ma'am. You can't you can't just talk about randomly <laughs> it's tossing up your castmates. If you're going to toss up anybody, it, it may or may not be the illegal immigrant from Kazakhstan. If anybody's going to be the first one in the line of fire, it's going to be Alina. Yeah, we're looking out and JJ out on this season, just in case. Yeah, if Hart and JJ, the Border Patrol cops from Amazing Race 20, were on the season, at least half of this cast would have been arrested by the end of the first episode and deported. And contestant Jill says he's like a cow, he chills and eats all the time. And he runs to free the next three, which is Bart, Christian and Else. And this group gets a direction puzzle, identifying where in Belgium four sets of directional poles could be. The total of these towns' postcodes is their locks code, and this is something that these three identified as a strength in their applications. And the final group is Bruno, Law and Salim. They need a ten number code and must match each contestant with an obscure picture that represents them. And Salim says that people will usually cross the street if they see him on his own, but when he's with his dog, they don't think he's super dangerous anymore. And talking of dogs, Law trained a guide dog for the past two years, which is something I 100% would not be able to do, because guide dog puppies are almost always adorable, and therefore I would not want to leave them. And Bruno says that he does card illusions for fun. Notice I said illusions, not tricks, because tricks are what a whore does for money. Or crack! Yep. And Alina says that she was an illegal immigrant for 16 years, and yet she's only 20. And she says it's easier than doing it, honestly. Yeah, because that whole thrill is gone. I mean, there's a thrill in just hiding somewhere and uh, not uh, not letting people know that you're illegal. Yeah, hiding somewhere in Antwerp, maybe under one of the many construction sites for their trains. Find, find her, like, underneath the hole somewhere, like Saddam Hussein. And as they open up the hatch, Elena just pops up and says, What for dumb, but they found me. I'm back to Kazakhstan. Get back in your cage. <laughs> and after half an hour of the challenge, no group is free yet, and no one is even close. And Bart says that he hates puzzles. He seems grumpy. <laughs> Maybe because he knows the puzzle isn't worth that much money. <laughs> He knows, he's like, why am I doing this? We're not, <laughs> nothing is up for grabs. There's always a delightful archetype in, in Demol Belgi, which is middle-aged man who I find incredibly annoying, and Bart is definitely satisfying that this time. However, he's also hilarious because he's basically grumpy cat, and when it's revealed that he took that much for an exemption, he just goes, yeah, money means nothing, we're here to actually find the mole. It's like, that's not the attitude you take with people who are already pissed off at you. You have to apologise. I know you're a lawyer, but you have to apologise and just say, I am sorry for doing this, I didn't realise it would actually have consequences. Or, don't make him treasurer. Yeah. You know what would have been great for that first room challenge is have cast somebody who is completely absent-minded as the counter goes up so they just get distracted by everything, like, oh... Uh, I want to say stop. Oh, wait, there's something shiny on the table. Oh, wait, my spinach puffs. They're almost done. I got to go check on them. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to call my sister. Oh, wait, I had homework to do. Let me quickly do my homework. Oh, shit, the counter's at 20,000 years. Wait, 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 wait. There was something. No, I forgot it. Wait, the counter. Yep, stop. Oh, we lost. We've lost 30,000 euros and we haven't even started yet. I do wonder what the um, what the upper limit for that would have been. Well, there's a reason why they started it a month before filming. Theoretically, maybe he, it could have been hours or days or weeks that Bart could have been in that room. Bring like a sleeping bag, um, MREs from the military, that is uh, meals ready to eat. 
wheel in the television for him as the counter keeps going up. And then when he's done, just yell out stop. He's actually trying to yell out stop for the his DVD movie to stop. And then the counter is revealed to have stopped at 100,000 euros. It's like a heist. Yeah, because we know that the upper limit of the pot tends to be 100,000 is the max they can earn. But they also have to have some sort of money that someone has to go away with. So there must have been an upper limit for the timer. I'm just not sure what it was. It it can't have been much more than 10,200. You would think 10,000 was the limit. If 10,000 wasn't the limit, then what was? 20? Yeah, because I don't think that they would want to go more than more than one or two episodes without actually having any money in the pot. That's the thing. 15,000? It has to be some sort of even number. Yeah, I, th- I think it was probably closer to 15 than 20. It's 20,000. That, that can take, for Belgian Mall, that can take like three episodes to earn. And we need to point out that 10,200 euros is right around the size of a pot for an entire season of V is the Mall. It was higher than last year's Vidim after 10 episodes. And Bart did it in two minutes. Bart the lawyer spent the entirety of a Vidim pot on one exemption. That's impressive. Makes Meryl sabotages look like weak sauce. And Jolene says that she really likes the Aldi mallow cakes. I don't know whether Aldi is sponsoring this season, but she really likes their mallow cakes and really wants some. Can you send her some, please? So in the pitch puzzle, Alina is a Kazakh flag, Bart is horses, Bruno is card tricks, Christian is a student club, Dorian is Sven Nice, Elsie's is ukulele, Jill is the bike, Julianne is the mallow cakes, Laura is the guide dog, and Salim is the popcorn. And Bruno, Law, and Salim are the first group who are free, followed almost immediately by Alina, Dorian, and Jolene. And Dorian is fine, she's just clumsy, and she is already my favourite. She is delightful. She is clumsy and afraid of a lot of things. Yep. She may or may not be a hindrance in physical challenges. Oh, definitely, but I mean, I knew just from when the pictures were released that she was probably going to be an an instant favourite, and she really is, because she's just bonkers. She's just that wonderful archetype that Belgian will find occasionally of someone who is genuinely a little bit crazy, but I'm sure she's really nice. Those are the two most important qualities in a in a, a mole contestant for Jill's. Yeah, because the consideration for someone like Jill, who is both showrunner and host, is that he has to find ten people who he would be okay spending three weeks with as well. Because he doesn't want to surround himself with horrible people. No, no, no one wants to go away off to Greece or Vietnam for the once-in-a-lifetime journey and just spend it with a bunch of douchebags. That should be the theme for one season where all of the douchebags who float around in casting, just cast them all for one season with Jill's and and see how it all works out for him. Then you know it's the last season. I do think that's probably why we love the casting of Belgian Mole so much, is the fact that they don't really tend to cast arseholes. I mean, they cast people who are occasionally irritating or frustrating, but they never cast people who are genuinely malicious, I would say. And if you do find them malicious, just put them in a, with a paint bomb, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Jill can just rig the season and put paint bombs near them. Annoying old lady, you're executed and you're in a car with a paint bomb. Enjoy. Decosted. Decosted. <laughs> and they free the final group from the chain with the correct town of Lokeren, and now have a fun hike to the end where the camera awaits. And then we cut back to a month before where the mole's voice is disguised by a computer, and the mole asks how much everyone would do to get a rice jelly. And there is a money clock which will begin running. If they want to bid on the first exemption, they need to stop the money clock. And to get to the camera, they've got to upsail down a cliff and climb up the other side. And Gilles goes first without much difficulty, and then Jolene looks stressed. And Bart is next. He rushes through it because he obviously doesn't want to be on that cliff. Laura is third, and she goes far slower than Bart did, and she bid €2,600 for the exemption. And the prize pot is confirmed to be more than €100,000 again. Bruno's fourth up. He looks terrified. He bid €7,500. And at this point, we hear a great version of The Sound of Silence. And Jolene is fifth. She bid 400 euros and falls a lot. Salim's sixth. He bid 2,100. 
Else is seven. She she bid five thousand one hundred. Alina's eighth. She bid five thousand four hundred. And then my favourite Dorian is ninth with eleven minutes left on the hill. And Christina left. She struggles and bid three and a half thousand euros and took just over six minutes to do the abseil. And then Christian is last. He has to go last. With seconds to spare, they all make it to the top and then five thousand euros to the pot. However. Molehouse Jill says that due to the bidding, they now begin with minus 5,200 euros of a possible 5,000 for the pot. And guess who gets the exemption? Jill plays this so well because he's like, he, he asks random questions for everyone and then just ends with, but here's your exemption. Oh, I forgot, I almost forgot something. Yeah, you guys are actually at negative 5,200 euros after winning this challenge. And Bart, here you go, little buddy, you get an exemption. Have a good day, guys. And contestant Jill bid absolutely zero as he didn't want to start the season in the red, which earned him the easiest escape. And Christian also bid absolutely nothing, but thought about it longer, so therefore didn't get the easy escape. And Bart won the exemption with a bid of 10,200 euros. But will never ever be suspected as mole for the rest of the season. And the mole's response was, that has been noted. <laughs> Do you remember the That Has Been Noted story, Saunders? <laughs> because I'm 99% that Jill is trolling me by putting that quote in there. No. So it was when I was on a cruise a couple of years ago. It was the uh, Beijing-Singapore cruise. Um, there was like a progressive trivia on the Five at Sea days. And on the third day, when me and my brother, as a two-person team, were beating all the six-person teams, there was a question that was, what is the height of a regulation basketball hoop? And the answer is um, 10 feet or 3.05 metres. And a woman heckled the host because she got the answer of 3.1 metres. The host then put it to the the rest of the teams and said, do you want me to accept that answer or do you want me to give her no points for it? Everyone in the room booed her, basically, and told her to get back. She then came up to me and my brother after the quiz had finished and said, noticed you were uh, rooting against me on that basketball question? And I said, yeah, well, you got it wrong. And she said, really? You're not going to apologise to me? I went, well, no, you got it wrong. And she went, okay, has been noted, and walked away, and then gave me evils every time she saw me for the rest of the cruise, which was a good week. <laughs> this was a middle-aged woman from New Zealand, and she gave me evils, and it was even funnier when she won one of the like little quizzes and won a keyring or whatever, and genuinely got up and just glared at me the entire time she'd won looking smug. And it's like, well, you won a fucking keyring. No one cares. But I later found out <laughs> off that quiz host, because we befriended him, that she also tried to claim that Russia was in the EU. Because the, there was a question that was, what's the largest country in the EU? And she said it was Russia. Ouch. Yeah, I'm 99% sure that Jill just put in the, okay, has been noted, quote, just to confuse me. Yeah, because he knows that much about your personal life. I've mentioned it on the podcast before, you just don't listen. Okay, it's been noted. And Bart defends himself by asking whether people are here for the money or to find the mole. And Jolene is not impressed with him. And she said she bid 400 euros and laid awake regretting it. <laughs> yeah. Just the pile. They should have had the pile of money of what made everyone sweat at night. So you have Jolene with the 400 euros. Like, Man, I can't believe I got rid of the 400 euros. And then you see the stat grow by another 9,800 euros next to Bart. And he's like, eh. <laughs> and then everyone heads to the hotel. And there are three rooms. And Dorian packs her photo of Sven Nice, who I googled afterwards to find out that it, he is a um, a cyclocross champion, who is Belgian, as you may have guessed. Oh, I thought he was a football player. No, he's a um, he's a cyclist. He uh, he's I think he was six time world champion at cyclocross. Uh, cyclocross is basically um, cycling round a muddy track. They only tend to do it in winter. Oh, like motocross? Yeah, it's like motocross, but on an actual bike. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. They probably have that in, like, Whistler or something. Yeah, the the guy most famous for it now is uh, Matthew Van Der Poel, who's um, a cyclocross world champion and now um, is also very good at road cycling. He keeps um, surprising people at road cycling, but he uh, he does both. How do you how do you surprise people at road cycling? Do you just pop out from the bushes or something? No, because nobody expects him to to be able to kind of transfer the skills that much, and you know he's done very very well. I used to race on a track. Oh no, another cyclist tipped over. I got to stop surprising people at cyclocross. Oopsie doodles and road cycling. I really should stop doing that. 
Are they going to make it into the Olympics? Because there's ski, ski cross and snowboard cross for the Winter Olympics. I assume cyclocross will not be too far off for summer. I don't know, because it tends to be more of a winter pursuit, because it's basically just a track filled with mud. Mm, oh, it's like pyramid, okay. Uh, they are talking about making cyclocross a winter Olympic sport, by the way. Oh, yeah, because they're fairly short on winter Olympic sports in general. That's why they added in ski cross and snow cross, because they want to keep trying to expand it. So at dinner in the hotel, best friend of the podcast, Jill, says that money isn't important. What's important is the hunt for the mole beginning. And he hands out the mole diaries, which is something that never happens in Dutch mole anymore. We never see them hand out a mole diary anymore. Well, now they have to get them because of coronavirus. There's no toilet paper around, so they need some sort of alternative to use. So they got to ration out that pages in the mole diary. What you couldn't see is that all the mole diaries are actually in uh, hermetically sealed bags. And Jill had to put on a hazmat suit to give them out. <laughs> and Jolene is still smarting at Bart, spending that much on an exemption, and says, who in God's name lets the counter go over 10,000 euros? Bart. <laughs> he did it in God's name. And Christian says that he knows how it is when people see him for the first time, how they react. He says it was obvious that one person had seen him for a second time, and that he won't forget it. Ooh. Who was it? See, there's two answers to that question. It's either the mole, or, potentially, Gilles de Costa, and he's the mole. Mm. Or Christian was in front of a mirror. And day two begins in Kalampaka. It's the final chance for them to get to look at Meteora, and the first chance for us to hear their playlists. And Jolene jokes in the car that Bart suggested Money for Nothing as his first song. Which kind of doesn't work as a joke, but it's still great. <laughs> Well, it's money for less than nothing because it's negative 5,200. They still have their refrigerator and their color TV and the other version of the song. And they drive from Kalampaka three hours to the town of Parga. And Jill has a day of fun for them, but it's a bit lonely for one person. They get to choose who, and Bart is basically volunteered for being the dickhead who costs them 10,000 euros. And for the other nine, they have to travel three kilometres to ring the bell of a lonely chapel on an island... Seven of them get to travel there by the Aquaspeed Extreme, uh, a raft pulled by a speedboat, and two with good general knowledge get a different path, which is parasailing, and they choose Dorian and Christian to do that. And each contestant on the island, when the bell is rung, earns 400 euros. Dorian and Christian control the speed of the rafts on Aquaspeed Extreme from their parasail by answering five general knowledge questions on each lap that the Aquaspeed Extreme does. Correct answers slow them down, wrong answers speed them up, and it's Salim, Jill, and Alina who are first on the rafts, and the first answer is wrong, but the second is right. And Bart gets a kayak to head to the island and help the others. He can hear the questions and help Dorian and Christian, not that they know he's helping. And he keeps getting the questions right, but they don't see him and keep giving incorrect answers. And Alina, it's fair to say, is not happy with them. Yeah, some of the questions they are missing were quite easy. Yeah, like the, the pescatarian question was really easy. Yeah, what do you not eat if you're pescatarian? Fish, nuts, or chicken? I think they don't eat fish. They eat pork and crazy meats and nuts. That's what I think a pescatarian eats. How do you think the mole would have done this challenge? What do you think the mole would have done to sabotage? You think you might want to be in the air to ensure that the boat's going as fast as possible. However, I guess if you're the one hanging onto the raft, you can just hit a random bump in the water and use that as, a, as an excuse to let go and make Bart do the extra effort to pull you back in. Yeah, I feel like the mole would potentially want the most control over this challenge, which is the parasail. But did the mole sabotage it all in this episode? I'm not sure. Because Bart did the work for the mole. Yeah, because <laughs> my, my assumption is that in those you're definitely going interviews with Jill. The mole's one was probably last. And Jill was probably behind the screen for the mole. So if the mole's one was last, then they would know exactly how much they needed to quote-unquote bid to not be the highest, because that obviously draws attention to yourself, and to not be the lowest, mm -hmm. because then that, um, that means that you're drawing attention to yourself by being the runner across the island, although it is a good spot to be in, because you can obviously impact the mole. Assuming that the mole knew it got up to 10,200 and that this episode at most would earn them 9,000 euros, the mole doesn't really have to do anything. The mole can just blend in and then start sabotaging next week, I would say. 
Or just do really minor sabotages in the challenge and not do anything too blatant. Yeah, I don't think the mole really needed to do much this week. No, I I would just try to blend in, especially when you start out at negative 5,200. Well, actually, it's uh, negative 10,200. Yeah, before the first challenge, yeah. Luckily, Jill softened the blow and didn't tell them what the pot was at till after they won a challenge. But if our assumption that the mole took a step back this episode is correct, then quotes from Alina like, fucking Christine and Dorian, I'm going to kill you, make it even funnier. Yeah, because no one's really trying to actively sabotage it. They just didn't know what pescatarian was or... Misheard the question. Yeah. What question did they miss here? It was the um, it was the pescatarian one, because they misheard it as which of these foods can a pescatarian eat. Oh, that's what they heard it as. Yeah, because that's why they said salmon rather than uh, rather than chicken. Okay. But also, if you're assuming that it's which, which of these foods can a pescatarian eat, I don't know much about pescatarians, but I'm kind of assuming they can eat nuts. Yeah, maybe all pescatarians are allergic. So Alina ends up getting flipped over and is fished out of the water. And anyone who gets dumped in the water gets uh, left on a raft near the island and has to wait for Bart to ferry them back. But Jill and Selim get on the island safely, and they realise that the bell is much higher than they anticipated, and say Christian wouldn't be able to reach it if he was on somebody's shoulders. And Selim legitimately suggests tossing a dwarf. That's so cringy. I know he didn't intend for it to be cringy. Yeah, I, I think if that had aired on an English language show, they would not have put that in the show. No. If it, was, if it was, like, on American television, not a chance. <laughs> they would get boycotted. <laughs> like, it's, it's not like a toddler that you just throw up and go, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. Like, this is a grown man you are suggesting that you're just going to toss up. They should deduct 10,000 euros just for that quote, just for that idea. They don't need to deduct any more money from this team, evidently. <laughs> So Elsa and Bruno are the next on the rafts. Bart gets it right, but they don't see him again. And he reaches the island, but then has to turn around and get Alina. And they get the next two questions correct, so Bruno and Elsa basically just swimming along. And once question four is incorrect, Elsa falls off the raft. And then Bruno also falls as they get the final question wrong, and he flies around the corner at the high speed. This challenge is just amazing. I like the cuts between them being up in the air, all peaceful, paragliding, or parasailing, and then those that are stuck on those aqua speed rafts. It's just really fun, because this challenge is basically pure character stuff of the insanity of the people on the rafts. It's hilarious because they're legitimately flying along when they're on the highest speed. When Bruno goes around that final corner at the highest speed, he is struggling to hold on, not unexpectedly, because it's bonkers. And then, yeah, you just get the, the nice serenity from, uh, from Dorian and Christian in the air. Of just, yeah, we're having a wonderful time, and then you just cut, cut back to Alina screaming obscenities at them. What sport has the largest plane service? Oh, I don't care about that, Jills. I'm just enjoying the, the nice views from up top and watching the water and the lonely island and the... Damn it, I was trying to think of a lonely island song. Um, I'm on a boat? <laughs> I'm on a I'm boat, yeah, the one. The one that's, you know, the obvious <laughs> one for this challenge, Saunders? <laughs> Man, what, what, well, there's a lonely island and people are on a boat. Man, I wonder what song Lonely Island is made. Is it any wonder that you are sleep deprived right now? <laughs> I've listened to like two of their full CDs. Yeah, we we didn't really go into this, but Logan's been been up for hours, even though it's really early in the morning for him right now because he's been teaching. I got up like half an hour before we were meant to record because I am jet lagged as hell from returning from Texas yesterday. <laughs> it's a bad combination. Everything's bigger in Texas, including the jet lag. Yeah, including the jet lag and the road rage. So, Jolien and Law are the final two up. They get the first two questions right. Bruno can't get in the raft and it is suspicious. And they get questions four and five right, so Jolien and Law get to approach the island at the slowest speed. And Elsa is now the only person on the raft and Bart kayaks over to her. She jumps on the tube, but he falls off the kayak. And Alina on Jill's shoulders is enough to ring the bell. They ring it with 41 seconds to go and earn 4,000 euros for the challenge, giving them a huge total of negative 1,200 euros of a possible 9,000 for the episode and season so far. Even though it's the most money earned 
by a group within a single episode, they still started out in the negatives. Yeah, they've pretty much earned the entirety of a vision pot in this episode, and they are still in the negative. Because of one Bart. I didn't do it. If they don't like that I took this exemption, they can eat my shorts. He's so unrepentant about it as well. Yeah, he's like, Ew, I, I took the exemption, I didn't care about the money. What you can do about it, you sons of bitches? He pretty much instantly makes himself the villain, but makes it ten times worse by his attitude from being called out for for this. Yeah, he's, he may as well be poking them in the eye in the eyes with a fork. I'm strongly suspecting that Bart is going to go home at some point mid season, and that literally nobody's going to be surprised that he's not the most. Like if there's a box of donuts, you know who's going to be the guy to take the last. Donut out of the box without checking with anybody else beforehand. It's gonna be Bart. He's just gonna take that donut and be like, "Well, are, are you are you here to are you here for the donuts? Or are you here to find out who the mole is? Or the or if they're like having their bottle of wine with Jill's and Jill's like, man, I had a long day of hosting. Um, I just want a little bit more of a red wine with this dinner. Why is it empty? Who did it? Well, Jill's, do you want to host and help us find out who the mole is, or you want this last bit of wine? Damn it, Bart. Hot for dumber. Hot for dumber, Bart. <laughs> a douchebag fell through my casting process for once. It took me five years. This show is cancelled. <laughs> See, the, the mole just kind of does sneaky actions. Bart goes to general malice. Did you hear the story about, like, Belgium trying to lock down the country due to coronavirus and the one person who slipped through? Yeah, Bart just started licking all the door handles and stuff, didn't he? Yeah, he's like, do you want to quarantine the country and minimize the effects of this virus, or do you want to find out who the mole is? I already love that. I know this is going to be an entire season-long joke of Bart is incredibly malicious at every opportunity. <laughs> so they have drinks on the beach, and Bart is suspicious at Kristen and Dorian not seeing him, and Jill pisses on their bonfire by announcing the first test and execution. And it is now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home. And contestant Jill said that the mole knew that the pot would be negative, so kept a low profile, which makes it difficult to do a test on. Salim says that the mole is a man. The women are too reserved except for Alina and Jolien, but they're a bit exuberant. Jolien says that Law could be the mole. Law suspects everyone, but finds it suspicious that Bruno didn't put card illusions under his name. Bruno says that it's weird Alina fell off at an easier speed than he did, and he finds that shady. Alina says that Salim is suspicious as he wasn't supportive on the island. Else says that Christian didn't know his Trappist beers but likes drinking beer, she's heard. Dorian says that Christian didn't discuss anything. Christian says that Dorian didn't spot Bart, but he only spotted one canoe on the entire sea. Bart says that there are few chances to spot a mole, so he's lucky not to have to do the test. You're not lucky, Bart. You just went above and beyond how much money needed to be taken out of the pot. And at the execution, best friend of the podcast, Shilda Costa, says that the group was successful, but the mole struck early and forced the pot into the negative. And he also has a new laptop. It looks wooden. Nice wood, Jills. And Alina, Bruno, Christine and Dorian all get green screens before Jill predicts his own demise and gets a red screen. And he says he has no regrets for bidding zero euros. And Alina says he was really charming and driven and he's upset to be going home already, and cries on his namesake's shoulder. The red screen, however, disappears to a message from host Jill, as we've not had an episode one twist yet. And he says that their search can become somewhat simpler if someone opens Pandora's box, and inside is the name of them all. Just in big letters. Oh no, I think I know exactly what they're going to do with that. Well, we'll discuss that in a minute. (laughs) There were supposed to be 11 people on this season, but we got really confused with our checked baggage. (laughs) I'm free this is why you guys were able to pass every challenge because the mole has been in the box for the entire first episode and the episode ends with a version of can't take my eyes off of you so next week everyone climbs a hill with camping gear on their backs Christian nearly knocks over a tower of glasses there's a Greek man with a bow and arrow everyone transports dogs Alina joins the dance troupe wedding cakes get transported else trusts nobody and there is a camera feed on Pandora's box. So, number one question. What do you think is actually going to be inside Pandora's box? It'll be the mole's name in Greek. Oh, it'll be Kathy. 
the winner from the 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 winner from the Argentina season who lives in Greece. She has to make a cameo this year. I think that it is going to be everyone's name is inside the box. Well, because the mole's name is technically in the box. But it's going to be like that and Sven nice. It's going to be a trick of some description, isn't it? Yeah, they're not just going to have like if Bart was willing to give up 10,200 euros for an exemption, imagine what he would give up to find out what's in the box. Given that Bart's only desire this season is to find out who the mole is, he doesn't care about the money, he's going to open Pandora's box, I suspect. But everyone's name is going to have to be in there. Or it is just a really just flat-out season that just doesn't have a good payoff where somebody opens the box in episode 3 and it's empty except just a name and says, it's Alina. <laughs> Like, oh, this is an anticlimactic season. It's Lena. Lena's the mole. What it should be is Gilles de Costa. It just has a, a signed picture from mole host Gilles de Costa in there. It's the final season. Gilles de Costa is the mole. What a twist. That's so meta. <laughs> so who do you suspect? Uh, I suspect Bruno, because of his card tricks and just... He seems overall sneaky to me. I suspect Lena because if she can be an illegal citizen in Belgium for 16 years, I think she can get away with casually and suddenly uh, sabotaging challenges for a couple of weeks on Belgian Mole. And number three, Julianne, just because I just can't get a good read on her yet. Same reason why I suspected Elizabeth after the first episode uh, last season. Just can't get a good read on her. And people who I can't get a good read on, that's who I want to suspect. And my top three so far are, well, we have one overlap. So mine are Christian, uh, Law, and Julianne. And it's more that I think that Christian would be hilarious if he is the mole. I think it's certainly not out of character for production to go, this is the one person who stands out, let's make them the mole. See also Peter in Mexico. And they could legitimately go, well, we made a priest the mole, why don't, why don't we make someone with dwarfism the mole? Law is another person who I just can't get a good read on. I feel like she she definitely played how the mole would in terms of staying in the background, just observing. And what's really suspicious, too, is that generally with the mole, the oldest female in the cast is the first executed 99% of the time. So the fact that Jill's went home first is like, well, by default, that means Laura's got to be the mole. Old, older women, unless you're Annalise, older women do not go far in the mole. I'm sorry. And also, the fact that the one thing that we learnt about was the guide dog thing. There could be something that they're going to play with in that she trains dogs to help people who can't see. And we started the season with a blindfold challenge, and she's the one person who you can't see being the mole. And yeah, my third suspect is Julianne as well, because it's a lot of the same reasons as for you. I just can't put my finger on it, but she just seems suspicious. She reeks suspicious. Yeah. There's just something not 100% for me with her. Some people use Irish spring body wash when they're in the shower. She uses Irish suspicion body wash. And, I mean, this episode was pretty obvious that Gilles was going to be going home. He got a lot of the um, a lot of the airtime. He, he was a very obvious contestant. He was 100% playing for the team. But ultimately... The host always wins, and Gilles got him sent home. Not everyone can be Lloyd. Maybe if he put on a little red Riding Hood dress, he would have gone further. And who do you think is going home next week? Well, this might it's final destination at this point because, quite frankly, the the older the, the oldest female contestant has to be run over sooner or later. I, I I don't make the rules. That's just how it is. Isn't that else? Is Els older than Lore? I assumed Lore was older than Els by a long ways. No, I think I think Els is older. What? No. Lore looks older. Els's haircut might be confusing me then. Yeah, Els is Els is fifty one. Lore's forty six. Oh, got a little Katrina Annalise duo going on here. Okay. Um... Els is the oldest person in the cast as well. Bruno's fifty. Okay, then Els. I guess Els will be. I just. Just based on appearance, I just thought Laura was a slightly older. Hopefully they don't listen to this podcast. Future Michael. Edit, edit that edit out. <laughs> We're really bringing that back this week, aren't we? Man, 
And I thought Bart was a douchebag, but now I feel like a douchebag after that quote came out of my mouth. Do you want to find out who the oldest person in the cast is, or do you want to find out who the mole is? I think that... Oh, I don't know. It's hard. Because <laughs> I can see basically everyone making a good, decent run at this. I'm going to plump for Salim. Purely because okay. his suspicion was that it was a guy this week. And I think we're both kind of maybe leaning more towards it being a lady. Yeah. Plus, I mean, he doesn't have the best ideas in the world from what we've seen so far. But then again, he could fulfill like the Baja role in Last Till the End. It's so difficult with Belgi, because we learn so much about everyone, and you can genuinely see them all making it decently far into this season. Yeah, they have an intelligent group this time. Yeah. So, it's time to get to our mole pool, because Logan doesn't know the teams yet. Okay. So... Your team is Bruno, Alina, Julianne, and Salim. Mine is Christian, Law, Els, and Dorian, leaving Bart as the lone straggler who will join the losing team next week, Shock Gaspara. I'm really happy with my team. And I'm really happy with mine. Like, I don't suspect really any of the people on your team. Well, it kind of worked out nicely for, um, for both of us in the fact that you got all of your top three and I got both of my top two before we started overlapping, which never happens. Awesome. I can't wait to see how this plays out. Yeah, should be fun. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll actually record reasonably early next week. Yeah, be much easier from now on. So have you got anything else to say? Nope, that's it. Cool. Thank you for listening to our Demol Belsey recap. We'll be back next week to continue the hunt for the newest mole. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Instagram, where we are at RTV Warriors. Or you can email us at contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at logsupercracky and I'm MJ Harmstone. Don't forget... Our Dutch Mall coverage finishes next week with my visit to Vondel Park over the weekend, so we're going to have the diary of a Dutch Mall finale coming out Monday and then the actual recap on Wednesday. We will see you for Belgian Mall next week. Peace out and just chill till the next of flavoring. Yeah. Look into my eyes, can't you see they're open wide? Would I lie to you, baby? That's a banger. <laughs> I know it's on losses, but it's still a banger.